I'll keep the music going. I'm not there yet. <laughs> Thinking even bingo in your numbers. You notice today's date? It's wonderful. 2002-2022. It's a great date, isn't it? Okay. Jesus uh, was and is the life of the party. If you look in the inside here, you see the outline of what I'm going to be saying over the next little while, and I'll be covering each of those headings. And we'll be looking at that passage, so keep it open in front of you. In fact, I'm going to sneak a little bit of last week and a little bit of next week in as well too, because the, the paragraph right at the end of last week was about Jesus healing a leper, which I hope you remember. And the one that comes next in chapter 3... Now, he entered the synagogue again, and a man was there who was, had a paralysed hand. In order to accuse him, they were watching him closely to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath. He told the man with a paralysed hand, stand up before us. And then he said, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do what is good or to do what is evil, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. After looking around at them with anger and sorrow at the hardness of their hearts, he told the man, stretch out your hand. So he stretched it out and his hand was restored and immediately the Pharisees went out and started plotting with the Herodians against him, how they might destroy him. Well, it's great to be here with you this morning and to see some old faces that I haven't seen for a long time, just getting a little older and... It's nice to see uh, some new people that I have not met before, and it's a great pleasure to be here with you. Uh, who doesn't like a holiday? I mean, we've just had our holiday season, haven't we? But they were funny holidays, but we like holidays, don't we? I mean, how could you not like a holiday? But it might come as a surprise to you to discover that actually God loves a holiday. In fact, he created holidays. Don't know if you've ever thought about it or not, but he... He, when he created the world on the seventh day, created the Sabbath. See, that's the heading I've got now, 1A. He's on the Sabbath. That is the holiday day. It's every seven day, knock off work. Take, take a break. Every day, every week, there is a holiday. It's commanded in the Ten Commandments. It's the fourth commandment. In fact, there's lots of other bits of the law in the Old Testament about the Sabbath and how you're to rest your crops, your animals, how everybody is to rest. It's not just a, a holiday for the bosses, the servants are to rest as well. Uh, everyone is to stop work. And this weekly pattern of work and rest, work and rest, work and rest creates a separation between work and rest. That's really important to actually have that separation. We're losing it a lot at the moment, aren't we? When we're working at home or working with computers anywhere, everywhere, all the time. And it creates the work-life balance, which so many people in our time-poor society are struggling with. Our modern computer world and the destruction of weekends where we no longer can actually take time off together is putting life out of kilter for a lot of working people and working families. But the scriptures, God created holidays. And Australians should love it because we were notoriously known as the land of the long weekends because we had more than almost anybody else. We love our holidays and our holiday times, but we're struggling now because of the destruction of the weekend. We're struggling to time, take time off with each other together in our families. Doing nothing time. It's important that we're not going anywhere to do anything. We're just being with each other and enjoying life and God's good creation and God's good gift of life and family. Worse still, we Christians in previous years, in the 40s and 50s and so on, we tried to defend the weekend the wrong way by banning pleasure on the Sabbath. We turned you shall not work on Saturday into you shall not play on Sunday. And so gave the impression that really God doesn't like any holidays, doesn't like you to enjoy yourself. We gave out the message that God was a serious spoil sport against all pleasure and against all enjoyment. 
But when you look at Mark chapter 2 and you meet up with God in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, you see that Jesus was the life of the party. So turn with me to the passage and, and look here for a moment. Or two. You're going to have to do some work, by the way. I'm going to ask you to talk to the people beside you, so I hope you really like them or know them vaguely anyway. And if you don't, get to know them. And then I'm going to get you to call out some answers for me too. So there's a bit of work we're just about to head to, right, on this passage. Because I think within this passage, there are people whom I'm calling the prisoners. You'll see there's a, 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 a lack of information on your outlines there, A, B, C, D. That's because you're filling it in, right? There are prisoners here, people who are in bondage. They're not free, but they're captives. Not locked up in prison, Long Bay Jail kind of prison, but locked up in the prison of their life at that time. And I, I could see six groups at least, at least there. And so I want you to talk to the person next to you and think through the passage that we've just had read to us. Uh, who are the prisoners? Who are the people who are captives? Who are the people who are not free, but actually under some kind of bondage in this passage? Go for it. I'll give you just a few minutes to do that with the people with you. Okay, well, let's see who we can get as a large group. You see, there's an advantage in our sharing our, our uh, information together. Who can tell me any prisoner at all? Yes. The paralytic. The paralytic. He's a prisoner, isn't he? Yes. Because he's, he's tied up, isn't he? He can't go anywhere. He has to have his friends to carry him there. But it was even worse to be a paralytic in the time of uh, Jesus because actually you couldn't go to the temple if you're a crippled person. And so you're excluded from the community. In fact, everybody would see a paralytic and know that he had sinned because why was God treating him and judging him like this? And so he was alienated from friends, from family. He had these friends who carried him there. But you get this incredible story of the paralytic. Yes, who? The... Oh, the tax collector. Oh, yes, the tax collector. He was a real captive, a dreadful man. You see... To, to get tax collecting in, in those days, you, you really had to bribe the Roman government to give you the job because it was a very good job for making lots of money. And so what you did was you, you paid a huge amount of money to the Romans one year, then you collected masses of amount of money the next year, which uh, just paid the taxes. Then the third year, you paid all the money for yourself, and then the fourth year, you had to pay the, for the Romans again. But it was worse than that because they were collecting money from the Jews to give to the Romans, who were oppressing the Jews. So here are the soldiers who are oppressing you, and you're paying for them to oppress you through this tax collector who is Jewish. It's a, he's a traitor, absolute traitor, a corrupt, immoral. You can't do... It's pretty hard to work out how you can be worse than a tax collector. It really was the pits. Yeah? I'm going to walk for you. Keep coming. The Pharisees, yes, they're, they're locked up in all their rules and regulations. And so, you know, they had so many rules and regulations, especially about the Sabbath. You know, you couldn't work on the Sabbath. Therefore, you couldn't look in the mirror. 
Now, why couldn't you look in the mirror? Because if you looked in the mirror, you may see a grey hair. Well, for some of us, yes, that's, that's the case, yeah. <laughs> but what's the problem with that? Ah, well, if you looked in the mirror and saw a grey hair, you might be tempted to pull it out. And pulling it out would be work, and you're not allowed to work on the Sabbath. And so there's got all these massive rules and regulations as to what you can't do. And fasting, you know, that's what he picks on the disciples and fasting. Anyway, the Pharisees, yes? Who else have we got? This side has been very quiet. These masks are dreadful, aren't they? Next week's going to be good, isn't it? Anyway, who did you say? The scribes, yes, the scribes were the people who actually worked for the Pharisees, teaching them the rules of the Pharisees had worked out. The scribes and the Pharisees worked together in this process of working out the rules and regulations for everybody, yes? Any others we've got here? Oh, yes. The fasters, fasters, yes. (laughs) They're denied food. You know, nearly every religion denies people food. Ever thought about it, you see? The, the Muslims have their fast days. The Jews had their fast days. There's, the, the Hindus are no, I can't eat this food and that food. If you eat pork on Friday night, right, you alienate everybody except the Chinese. The Chinese eat everything all the time. That's, that's the character you can even eat the chook's foot with the, with the Chinese. But, but everybody seems to get alienated by... You don't feast, you fast. Feasting is holidays, is happy time, isn't it? Fasting is mourning, is sadness, is... And the Pharisees, and not only the Pharisees, but John the Baptist's disciples, they were fasters, not feasters. They weren't party people, they were mourners. Yes, any others we see in captivity? I've got a very eager, well-educated one down here who's marvellous and I love your hand, but I'm going to ask some of the older people who aren't as clever as you. Come. Yes? The, sorry? The women. The women certainly are, but in this passage I'm not sure there were women. Were they mentioned? But the women are ever since the time of Genesis chapter 3. There is that being suppression. The sinners, yes. Who are the sinners? Well, they're all of us in one sense because we all are sinful. But they, there was a group that they saw as sinful that went with the tax collectors. So why is he eating with the tax collectors and the publicly notoriously immoral people, the sinners that they are speaking of? Yeah. So there's lots of What's your last one. The sick, you're not wrong. I'm glad. This, you are, what's your name? Phoenix. Phoenix. Phoenix has got it. The sick, you see, that man who was the leper, right? he had to go around. We understand it just at the moment. You know, when there's a pandemic, you've got to avoid people, haven't you? One of the pandemics of the ancient world was skin diseases. Once you got skin diseases, it was contagious. Therefore, he had to stay away from people. Leprosy was the classic one, but the word is, is, is not just includes lepers. It was anybody who had skin diseases. You had to stay away with every... And so what you did was you called out unclean, unclean. And of course, you were unclean. Your skin was unclean. And you couldn't meet with anybody else. People would leave food out for you, but you couldn't go and eat with anybody because you might make them unclean. And so... You were, you were locked out from society, from friends, from family, and you spent all your lifetime in the street saying, I'm unclean. That's a lovely way to live, isn't it? COVID patient, COVID patient, COVID, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah exactly, that's, that's what it was. The lepers of today, I always think... Uh, are the poor people who still smoke cigarettes and therefore at, you see them outside office blocks in little corners puffing and everybody is avoiding them. I'm sorry if you're a smoker. Uh, well, I'm sorry for your health and I'm sorry for your money. Uh, it, it doesn't mean you're unspiritual, 
but you're treated as if you're a leper. You're treated like, you know, you've got a disease, you've got to be stuck away somewhere else. Please stay away from me. Now, <laughs> all these people, you see, are captives. What, why have we got all these captives, these prisoners, these people in bondage in this chapter? Because it's all about Jesus bringing release. That's what it's about. It's the release that Jesus was bringing. In each one of them, Jesus frees them from their captivity, their, their alienation, their condemnation, their, their shame. And in each of these releases, it's surprising. There's a surprising element. I mean, the leper back in chapter 1, verse 20, 41, Jesus reached out and touched him. Nobody touched a leper. That's like kissing a COVID patient. You know, you just don't do that. But instead of Jesus getting his disease, he gets cleansed by Jesus. It flows the opposite direction to your expectation. Or the man who's lowered down through the roof. Now, that was, that's a gathering you'd never forget, isn't it? You know, some people say, how, can, how do they remember 30 years later what was taking place? Well, let me tell you, at my age, it's not really hard to remember 30 years earlier. That's simple. Yesterday, that's difficult to remember. But 30 years ago, hey, I got that down pat. Uh, what happened 30 years ago? 1992. Can anyone tell me anything happened in 1992? Your son was born. Do you remember? Yeah, there are certain things in life that are very memorable. And, and you do, you can't help but remember these great things. Uh, this shark attack this last week reminded me immediately of the shark attack in Middle Harbour back in 19, whenever, 60 something, it was a lot longer than 30 years ago, where the young actress was taken, although she was actually only in water up to about her knees, her thighs, and she was taken by a shark. Not hard to remember that event. She'd been converted to the 59 Billy Graham Crusade, so it was about 1963, something like that she was taken. Well, 63 is a lot more than 30 years ago. It's nearly 60 years ago. But I remember it. Why? Well, it was such a shocking thing. <laughs> you don't remember everything, but the big thing, you remember the day when we were all there together and suddenly the roof opened up and then this bloke was lowered down on, on, a, on a mattress, kind of, on, a, on, a, on his bed. Do you think you would forget that day? No way in the world you'd forget that. I always think it's an interesting thing, you know. You've got four blokes lowering it down. If the two at the feet lower faster than the two at the head, <laughs> I mean, he's paralysed, so there's not much more he can do except for slide in midair. Is anyway, but <laughs> I was a child. I went to Sunday school. These stories filled my imagination. You remember certain things. But what's surprising is, when he gets there, Jesus says to him, be healed, go walk. No, he doesn't. He says to him, your sins are forgiven you. And you want to say, Jesus, check the legs. You know, he hasn't come for his sins, he's come for his legs. You, you, you know, you've missed the point. But there's something even more astonishing than that. And the scribes, the Pharisees, they saw it. Who does he think he is forgiving people's sins? You know, now Cameron does the wrong thing by me. I can say, Cameron, you're forgiven. And you can say, oh, I wonder what Cameron did to him. You know, but that's between us, isn't it? But if I say, all you people over there, you're all forgiven. Well, what have you ever done to me? Except be slow to answer the questions. <laughs> no? Well, you haven't done anything to me. Who do I think I am that can say, all your sins are forgiven. You see, only God can forgive sins like that. Or again, notice the surprise that he eats with sinners. He's supposed to be the holy man of God and he hangs around with a low life. And he doesn't fast. All religious people fast. But he feasts because he sees himself as a bridegroom. In our, in our weddings, we all wait for the bride. But in the Jewish weddings, they waited for the bridegroom. But when the bride comes, you feast. But until the bride comes, you just hang out waiting for the food, don't you? And other things, the photos, uh, and her. But you, you, it's, it's, there's no wedding until the, until the bride comes. There's no wedding until the bridegroom comes. And when the bridegroom's there, 
It's feast time. It's happy time. Who fasts? Who mourns at a wedding? A wedding is full of fun and pleasure and enjoyment. And Jesus says, as long as you've got me, the feasting is on. That's why I don't tell my disciples how to fast. Mind you, he does say something about being taken away, but more of that in a moment. He then says in verse 28, you see, they're all caught under the law about rules and regulations. They want to say it's, it's against the law to, to just pick up some, some grain on the way. And Jesus says, no, the law was made for man, not man for the law. And indeed, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. This is an extraordinary thing to be saying. And then in chapter 3, he looks at anger because they won't, they won't allow a man to be healed on the Sabbath. The Sabbath is for doing good, not for doing bad. But you say, oh, you mustn't heal him on the Sabbath because that's work. Let him continue with a withered arm. Let him continue with a destroyed body. But don't heal him on the Sabbath. Jesus, because he was surprising, he was always, as Cameron told us at the beginning, controversial. Who can forgive sins but God alone, they ask? Oh, why is he eating with sinners and tax collectors? What kind of religious man does that? Or chapter 2, verse 18. How, how come he doesn't fast like everybody else, even John the Baptist? Now, John the Baptist is a friend, not an enemy like the Pharisees, but even John the Baptist fasts. So how come? And, and it's not lawful to go picking up things. And notice at the end of where I finished reading, chapter 3, verse 6, the Herodians met with the Pharisees and plotted to kill him, to destroy him. That, 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 that's like saying, you know, the Greens met with the, the, the Nationals to agree about they don't like him. No, it's not liberal labour. It's out there on the fringe. The Herodians hated the Pharisees. The Pharisees hated the Herodians. But they both hated Jesus more. Because he undermined everything for everybody. He also has this controversial title he keeps talking about, the Son of Man. It's mentioned 14 times in Mark's Gospel. Jesus is the only person who uses it. And he always uses it about himself. No one else calls Jesus son of man. And he doesn't call himself anything else but son of man. Now that becomes therefore a technical term. So let me just take a couple of moments with it. The first time it's used is in chapter 2 verse 10. That the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins. And the second time is in chapter 2 verse 28. That the son of man is the lord of the sabbath. The phrase son of man was, was an Aramaic, Jesus spoke Aramaic as best we know, an Aramaic phrase. Aramaic's a cross somewhere between Hebrew and Arab, Arabic, but he spoke this, this form, Galilean form of speech. Son of man was a phrase that had three different meanings. Firstly, it meant human. You know, son of man, get on your feet, says God to, to Ezekiel. just means human. Secondly, it can mean oneself. It's it, when you talk about yourself as if you're somebody else, uh, one can have one's corgis looked after in one's palace if one wants to, but one generally does not. Uh, you know she's talking about herself, but you also know it's a bit weird. But then if you live with, in a palace with corgis, you are slightly unusual. I won't say weird, that would be disrespectful to our gracious sovereign lady so when jesus talks about oneself you know he's talking about himself but it's, it's odd there's a third reason in daniel chapter 7 the judgment of the world takes place and at a critical moment in the judgment of the world just as god is about to judge everybody a man a son of man comes to god and God gives him all power and authority to rule over all nations and all peoples for all time. You don't know his name. You don't know anything about him. He comes, just, he just arrives. The son of man who's going to rule the universe in the judgment day. Jesus calls himself son of man. He's emphasising he's human. He's talking about himself. But he actually means... 
He's the fulfilment of Daniel 7. That's why the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins. That's why the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath, the end of the world age, you see. But they don't understand that. They don't hear that because they think he's just talking about himself. Or is he? And so he's posing this question by this phrase, Son of Man. But he also likens himself to being the bridegroom because <laughs> he's the one who brings the feasting of the great day, the great age, the great celebration. You see, when, when, when God's judgment comes, heaven comes, and heaven's a feast time. My grandsons will be there, that's for sure. It's full of food. It's full of joy. My granddaughters will be there cuddling too. And the idea is the same we have here, you see. A new age is coming. You, you, it's, it's, it's a completely different age. You can't put old wine in new wineskins. And it's just not the same. Something fundamentally is changing with the coming of Jesus. The Pharisees imprison people in their laws. Even John, because of the fasting over the sinfulness of the nation and calling upon people to repent, didn't come to the release but Jesus comes bringing forgiveness and acceptance and party time of salvation. Jesus is bringing in the Sabbath, the end of the world, the rest time for the holidays when the diseased and the sinners and the outcast and the traitors will all be forgiven and, and a fresh start happens, a clean slate is given. And so the judgment at the end of the world will be a time of great mercy and but it comes from the repentant. With Jesus present, it's party time. But in verse 20, he's going to be taken away for the cross. And that will be sad time. But not ultimately the sad time because he's going to rise from the dead. He's not saying it here, but we know that now, don't we? And with the resurrection, it's the feast time. And so while we're in this world, we have a sense of fasting because it's such a sinful, wretched world and, you know, what's going to happen with the... Is there going to be war with the Russians and is there going to be... And we've got the sicknesses here and we've got the corruption there and, you know, there's so much to complain about in this world if you want to, but if you live with Jesus, you're also a part of the Sabbath world, the next world, the world to come. This is the happy time. This is the feast time. This is the day of the Lord. Let's rejoice and be glad in it, you see, because we're in this day. And so in Australia today, we still have moralists, people who make up rules for others and imprison others in their failures. I mean, it can be the religious ones who, with rules and regulations about church going and about clothes that you wear and about fast days and, and what you can eat and what you can't eat and the like. But it's, it's wider than that. Moralists today are about sexism and racism and environmentalism and veganism and, and there's no joy in a moralist's life. Have you noticed that no matter what happens, they can find something else to complain about, something else to warn you about disasters happening if all the moralists are to be believed, the world has been going downhill since 1066 and the battle of the... I mean, it's always going downhill. There's always, oh, this is not right, though. There's sad sacks if ever you met them. Constant criticism and disappointment in a world going wrong. And so they censor people. They shame people. They attack people in the social media. And in the end, they cancel them. You're not allowed to even be here. You've got no platform. You can't speak. But Christianity is not about being moral. Christianity is about being forgiven. Christians aren't good people. Christians are forgiven people. Hey, if Christians are good people, I'm not one. But if Christians are forgiven people, I am one. <laughs> but the thing you've got to do to be forgiven is sin. Well, I've done that, and so have you. So don't look at me like that. You've all done that, haven't you? We've made our contribution to forgiveness. And God has made his contribution to forgiveness by sending his son to die for us. And so forgiveness is what we're about, a clean sight, 
And that's what makes Jesus such a controversial king in his day and continues to be one in our day because it doesn't fit people's expectations. The world outside thinks that we're here having moral lessons about the rules and regulations of what you're to do and what you're not to do and what you... No, we're here for party time. That's what we're here for, enjoying life with our brothers and sisters in the family of God, singing his praises and enjoying each other's company. That's what we're here. Feasting next week. They cancelled it this week. They're feasting next week, right? That's the character of it. But, of course, you've got to be part of Christ's party. You've got to have Jesus as your Lord and Saviour. For it's only by his death and resurrection that we know our past is forgiven and our future is assured. That knowing our past is forgiven, knowing our future is assured, we can face God. Not afraid of God, not terrified of God. God's not an ogre that to avoid. God is my loving Father who wants me to enjoy the life that he has given me. He wants you, he wants us to enjoy the life that he's given to us. He wants, and we can face our brothers and sisters with honesty and truth. Friends, I'm not really good. I have done bad things. And I know you have. And we don't have to pretend to each other. It changes the game. And I could face the mirror and see the grey hair and say, isn't that good? I don't have to pull it out. I don't have to pretend to be something that I am not. I can rejoice in the good things God has given. Do you remember the parable of Jesus of the prodigal son? You know how the son who took the money and went away and then spent it all on wild living and then when he's down and he's at the bottom of the pig's pit he suddenly comes to his own right mind and says life in my father's house for the servants is better than life out here in this world. So he goes home and repents. Remember how his father welcomes him? rejoicing my son who is lost has been found my son who is dead is alive every parent knows that feeling you don't want your kids to go off the rails but boy any kid who did go off the rails and comes back like that the joy would be just overwhelming wouldn't it when the sinner comes back to God through the death of the Lord Jesus Christ heaven is filled with joy the angels rejoice and the father rejoiced, and what did he do? Put on a party. That's what he did, because his dead son had come back. Do you remember the old brother? The moralist? Gee, I've been here all the time. I've been working really hard. You never give me a party. I just got to go out and look after the things. I suppose you want me to actually cook the barbecue for these people. <laughs> you know? The moralist never has the joy. Because the moralist never feels the father's joy. What about you? <laughs> Do you know the joy of knowing the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour? Do you know the joy of sins forgiven? The joy of being able to face the truth and to know God is your Father and to rejoice in the pleasures that come from being in the Sabbath day. If you don't, then make sure you talk to someone. Talk to Cameron about it. I'll be around for a little while afterwards. Come and talk to me about it. Because we would want you to enjoy the party. We don't want anybody left outside the party. We want you in the party to enjoy it with us. As the old saying goes, the more, the merrier. So come and join us in the great party of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that he came to release us and to rescue us from the condemnations of this world, from the failings of this world, from the rules and regulations of religion and philosophy and moralists, that he came to give us new life, free from our sinfulness, paid for fully by him, and brought to new life by his spirit through his risen resurrection. Help us, each one, Father, to rejoice in our life that you've given us, not to be persuaded into that kind of negativity again. And pray, Father, for those of us who do not yet know Jesus as Lord and Saviour, that as we come week by week hearing about him, we may change our mind and understanding of him, 
and see him as the one you said to save us and we may turn back to you through him and find the forgiveness that he's won for us. And we pray for each other, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.